I'm happy to introduce a terrific session now called Beginning to Understand Liverpool and Manchester Railway. And our speaker is Graham Mills. Mr. Mills is a semi-retired university academic with a long-standing interest in education-related applications of OpenSim. And welcome, Graham. I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Thanks very much. I hope uh, everybody can hear me okay. And many thanks to uh, Avacon for organizing the conference and for uh, Meg for introducing me and bringing everything together. Uh, I talked briefly on this subject last year. The uh, it, it's a subject that fascinates me clearly. Uh, it's very much a personal project and one that I'm interested in pursuing basically because I, I live in uh, Liverpool. At the other end of the line in Manchester, uh, the, there's a kind of symbiotic relationship between these two cities and it goes back a long way now, uh, back to 1830, uh, when a railway line was built between them. Liverpool, if you know, is in the northwest of England and uh, it's a major seaport. And it basically served as uh, the point of uh, import for things like cotton, for example, which were transported by the railway to Manchester. It was so much more effective than the sort of use of roads, which were very poor in those days, and canals, which were much slower. Manchester was the centre of the cotton manufacture weaving in those days, and uh, the two uh, lived very much, as I say, in symbiosis. And along the way, um, there were lots of collieries that opened, so there was kind of the whole thing was being fueled. And it's a fascinating time, politically, socially, and economically. So I, what I'm trying to do is to develop a, a sort of topographical model of the railway. Um, I talked last time about one station, which we'll look at in a moment, but I'm basically extending this out along the line to Manchester. And the, the reason for being interested in this is, is also because a lot of people regard the Liverpool and Manchester Railway as the first modern railway. It was the first time that all the elements of modern rail travel were brought together in one place. Uh, on the other hand, its lifespan was actually quite short. It was so successful that basically uh, the whole thing mushroomed and the the railway, although it still exists, um, but it was merged into uh, much larger uh, organizations. So there's a, a very limited visual record simply because it lasted in its original form for such a short period of time. There are some maps, a few plans, and I'm going to be speaking mainly about artwork. And I will be taking you on a notional journey uh, from Liverpool to Manchester in 1830 or thereabouts and introducing some of the uh, places and events that took place and some of the structures that were built along the line. In particular, I'll be talking about the Rainhill Trials. These determined that locomotives were actually the way to go. Uh, they were held really close to the actual opening. You know, even at that stage, they weren't quite sure how they were actually going to move uh, goods and passengers along the line. And I'm going to talk about something that they actually didn't think was terribly important, uh, the evolution of stopping places, what we now regard as intermediate stations on the line. So they were very interested just in Manchester and Liverpool, everywhere else in between, not so much. I have to say uh, some caveats to start with. I'm neither an engineer nor a historian. I might sort of make claim to being a hobby historian now. Um, and much of what I've done is basically is scratch modeling. So uh, using basic building and scripting skills. And what I would kind of say to you is that basically if I can do this, uh, then uh, it should be accessible uh, perhaps on different topics to other people as well. So there's nothing earth shattering about what I've, I've done. Uh, in terms of the actual extent of the build at the moment, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, I guess there are about 10 levels. Uh, so there's a, a, 
uh, a ground terrain uh, aspect to it and then uh, some nine sky platforms which will take you uh, all the way to Manchester. That's uh, by no means complete so there's quite a long way still to go. When it comes to interpreting the artwork it's actually quite a complex problem because the railway as such was very much in flux around this time uh, when it opened it wasn't finished it was very much experimental they didn't quite know how things were were working there was no uh, nothing to base their decisions on when you actually look at the uh, the limitations um, some artists doubtless uh, used artistic license, some images became reversed during the copying process. We know relatively little about the true color of what we were looking at. This is 10 years before there was any even black and white photography. Uh, we know nothing about the elevation of many of the buildings that we can see on maps. Uh, and we know very little detail about the terrain as it was then. So. All I can say is that what we have is a working hypothesis. And when I show you some of what I've built, um, you'll occasionally see things highlighted in red. And these are anomalies that sh are shown in some uh, artwork, but not in others. Uh, I have tried to stay to, as far as possible, uh, real world dimensions. Uh, this becomes difficult when you're talking about buildings because the normal avatar size and we so easily forget this um, is way in advance of two meters uh, so uh, as a consequence uh, with buildings uh, it, it it helps to be able to build the uh, the elevation is a little bit stretched uh, but when it comes to the actual railway and the locomotives and carriages uh, these are relatively um, built to scale and I actually operate with a reduced size avatar uh, oh, sorry, one too many. I hope you're seeing now uh, the Liverpool Crown Street station. This was the terminus uh, in Liverpool. And you can see an, a now and then view of the, uh, uh, the area. It's now a public park. You can see uh, in the public park at the top there, uh, a large ventilation shaft. Okay. Uh, and if you go back to 1830, uh, the building in the middle there is the actual station. And this is what the artists all uh, drew and painted, this view uh, looking at the station and the tunnel beyond that was the commence, uh, the start of the line. But there were a whole lot of other buildings uh, that we can see on maps uh, and some of them we can make guesses at as to their appearance based on uh, other um, uh, records. So for example we now know that there is an entrance building and it's quite likely that this in fact was where uh, the uh, the train crews who had to overnight in Liverpool before going back to Manchester were put up. If we look at the extreme uh, right, you'll see that there's a windmill and the windmill uh, persisted for a good few years uh, despite the presence of this uh, very busy station and works alongside uh, and it actually supplied water. It's acted as a pump source uh, for water for the station. You've got to remember this station was right on the outskirts of the city. It was very poor infrastructure to start with and it's this kind of aspect that I think OpenSim is really good for integration uh, and making you think about the various aspects. So now if we look back at the park and we can see the, the ventilation shaft, this actually is for another tunnel uh, which uh, runs uh, under the original um, uh, station. Uh, it was added so that locomotives could work the tunnel subsequently, uh, but much later. But we can also see uh, to the left of the station area uh, that there is a goods area and beyond that there is actually a works and that is where they built the carriages and wagons uh, for the railway. So there's a lot there that we don't uh, really understand and need to study in more detail. 
But now moving on on our journey. Oh, sorry. One one last thing I forgot to say in the previous slide uh, is that just beyond the station, the only other uh, significant institution in the area was the Bot Botanic Gardens. This had opened in 1803. Uh, it was just adjacent to the station. And of course, as soon as the station uh, moved there, uh, the works and, and so forth, there was a lot of pollution. And as a consequence, uh, the botanic gardens had to move on. But it's a, in terms of the build, it's a very interesting contrast uh, with the, uh, the station next door. So uh, that, that's been a, a slight detour for me. So if we go about eight miles along the track uh, towards Manchester, uh, we arrive at a village called Rain Hill. And this was the location for the locomotive trials in 1829. Uh, and the big question they needed to answer was, were they going to use locomotives at that stage or were they going to use um, fixed stationary engines and basically rope haul uh, the uh, about, there'd be about 31 of these, one per mile, basically rope hauling groups of carriages along this railway. So history could have taken a very interesting turn at that stage, but fortunately uh, that didn't happen. There were people who very sincerely believed in locomotives and the Rainhill trials were a major um, success for them. But the Rainhill trials are somewhat misunderstood in terms of their topography. Um, the one thing that Rainhill is known for is its skew bridge, which is at a, a, a sort of very acute angle, uh, took a turnpike across the railway. And people locate the grandstand uh, that uh, the dignitary sat at, there are some 10,000 people that, are, that uh, came to see the trials. They locate that next to the bridge. But we know, in fact, that the grandstand of the bridge was some qu quarter of a mile, 400 meters or thereabouts uh, apart because they were used as timing uh, locations. There were posts there where uh, people were taking interval times. So this very common model, which you'll often see, um, is, is not likely to be correct. There is a second uh, French uh, illustration, which is probably also a reconstruction, uh, but is likely, more likely, I suspect, to reflect what is actually happening. So here again, we're now looking north and the grandstand is immediately uh, to our uh, left. Uh, and you can see that there is a, uh, sh a workshop there, uh, a tent for refreshments, uh, and uh, as well as the track. And if we just go on to the next slide, hopefully what you can see is the skew bridge there right at the extreme right and on the left, the sheds and the grandstand, now 400 meters from the bridge. So you can see that the French illustration is, is likely a, probably a reconstruction, but it it's fits much better with what we know about the location of all the elements. Uh, in terms of the actual contenders, uh, there were three engines that were uh, involved. Uh, so the most okay. famous one is the yellow one, uh, which is uh, Rocket. Uh, we have Saint Pauille, uh, which is the green one. And the one that looks like a tea trolley um, is Novelty. And Novelty was the crowd favorite because you look so cool just standing on Novelty and going along. All the others had to try uh, much harder. So on from Rain Hill. Now we have early stations. Uh, there's a station called Collins Green, uh, which didn't uh, survive for very long. But what we see there is something we see on maps also in other locations. And that is that the early stations evolved from stopping places, basically where there was a level crossing. 
So there was a road uh, and this needed to be uh, a point that was manned and in many cases they needed to provide accommodation uh, to the gatekeeper who was responsible for organizing, uh, for, for maintaining the safe operation of the railway. And this is where people came because they uh, came to get onto the trains and got off the trains because, because there was a member of staff there, they could stop the train. And this allows us to make certain uh, guesses as to the way in which stations evolved. So here we have our octagonal uh, cottage, as it were, and we have the yellow areas here, which will appear. The bay at the front may have been the sort of first place that passengers colonized, and then the heated area on the left may be extended into that region. Okay, so that's my hypothesis that the front bay evolved into the waiting room because there was nowhere basically uh, for passengers to go. So uh, I just want to end with uh, the, uh, one final station, uh, one final feature, and this is the Sankey Viaduct. It's now a grade one listed viaduct, go, dates all the way back to 1830, but it's still used. It was over-engineered basically. It is 60 feet high and was able to take uh, the uh, the ships, uh, the uh, Mersey Flats, as they were co called, the barges carrying goods uh, under the railway arches. So it went over the Sankey River and the uh, canal. And I'll just end by hopefully giving you a demonstration of that. And here we can see uh, in all its glory, three of the nine arches of the uh, Sankey Viaduct and indeed one of the uh, barges uh, roughly to scale. So we're just going to skip over a couple of slides and merely end by thanking everybody uh, for uh, basically providing an absolutely wonderful tool for studying historical sites uh, such as the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. Being able to build affordably on this kind of scale is fantastic. Um, things like blogging and Twitter are very useful uh, accessory tools uh, and I just want to end by acknowledging the Liverpool and Manchester Railway Trust who do a lot to provide uh, uh, background information on this kind of thing. And then, of course, the open sim viewer and content developers and the service providers that make this such a great community. OK, <laughs> apologies for probably overrunning a little bit. And thank you very much. Graham, thank you. Wow, that was a fantastic presentation and showing us literally how open um, simulator can be used for historical recreations. Uh, there's so much we can do with that, and I hope more and more people take advantage of that. Um, so thank you very much, Graham. And I, um, I want to encourage uh, everyone here to visit our OSCC 17 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations like this one and explore the hypergrid too. Uh, there's hypergrid tour resources uh, in OSCC Expo 2 region along with sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all the OSCC Expo regions. So make sure to stop by each one of them. Our next session is going to begin at 8.30 a.m. And it's going to be open simulator statistics. So stay tuned and we will see you here at 830.